Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and a warm welcome to panel two of, of this uh, pre-Gallian forum, the first UK pre-Gallian forum. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Mel Walker. I'm an advisor to biotech and digital health companies, and I have a particular passion for patient access, which is why I'm excited to be on this panel today, which is all about access to innovation. Um, although this is the first UK forum, I actually remember attending a, an award ceremony in the UK well over a decade ago. And at that time, Sir Michael Rawlins was hosting the awards, who was the CEO of NICE. And I remember thinking it was really important to shine a spotlight on the whole topic of patient access, because at the end of the day, innovation is useless unless it actually gets into the hands of patients who will benefit. So uh, with that, I'm delighted to have a, a superb panel of uh, healthcare leaders with us here today. Uh, all of the leaders you see uh, on the panel today have made major contributions, both personally and through the organizations they, that they lead to the UK healthcare system. So I'm not going to read out the biographies because you have them in your packs, but I did want to briefly introduce each of the panelists. So to my immediate right, we have Sir Patrick Valance. Uh, Patrick is the Chief uh, Scientific Advisor to the Government and also Head of the Science uh, and Engineering Profession. Uh, previously, he was the President of R&D at GSK. And I think that's fantastic because we have not only a perspective from the policy context, but also a deep understanding of what drug developers face uh, in terms of the challenges of bringing innovations to market. Next, we have Professor Carol Longson. Uh, Carol uh, is an independent advisor and also the vice chair of the Medicines Discovery Catapult. Um, Carol has a long history of being a pioneer in the HTA field, not just nationally, but internationally as well, and spent some time leading the technology appraisals at NICE. Um, Carol also has some industry perspective because she worked at GSK early in her career, and she also spent some time as the chief scientific officer uh, at the ABPI. Then we have Lord David Pryor. David is the uh, senior advisor and deputy chair of Lazard, a global investment firm. Uh, David has uh, most recently had the role of the chair of NHS England, and I hope he will bring that perspective here today. Um, David uh, has held a number of senior uh, roles in the healthcare sector, um, and he's a progressive who's made a major contribution to the life sciences vision. I think many of us are familiar with that here today. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to welcome Dr. Sam Roberts, uh, CEO of NICE. Uh, congratulations on your recent <laughs> appointment. Um, Sam uh, has held a number of healthcare roles as well, uh, but particularly has a passion for access to healthcare innovation. Um, as a, as she had a role as the chief exec of the Accelerated Ask Access Collaborative. Um, so welcome. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you all here today. I do know that the audience will be keen um, and have lots of questions to ask. So I'd like to start up with a bit of a, a warm-up question, if you like, about the context of the UK environment as being attractive uh, for life sciences and for innovation. And I have some stats here that I'd just like to share with you. So uh, there was an I some IQVIA surveys that looked at the UK market attractiveness. Some of you may have read these. But if we cast our minds back to 2018, when the first of these surveys were, were carried out, we may remember Brexit negoti negotiations were not going well. EMA had just decided they were going to leave uh, the UK and go to the Netherlands. And I remember when I was in my industry role having quite a gloomy view of the UK market from a headquarters perspective. At that time, 50% uh, of global life science executives stated that Brexit made the UK less attractive for launches, and a further 40% said the UK was less attractive for conducting clinical research. If we fast forward to last year, and a similar survey that was conducted said uh, that 81% stated they thought that leaving the EU had made the UK the same or more attractive for launches, and 76% responded that the UK was the same or more attractive for clinical research, versus only 3% in 2018. So I think that's a massive about turn uh, in terms of farmer optimism. And so my first question to the panelists is really about that. What do we think are the key developments that have really led to this uh, sort of volt fast, if you like, in farmer optimism? And how are those developments supporting access to innovation? I'd like to start off in this order because, and, and Patrick, uh, if you'd like to go first, because I know that you joined uh, as your, in your advisory role at the time when the first survey was uh, produced, which was pretty gloomy. So from your perspective, you've seen uh, that shift uh, firsthand. Yeah, thank you. I mean, the first thing is uh, beware surveys. That's the message that comes <laughs> out. But um, uh, look, I, I think there are a number of things that have happened. F first is that 
Um, and I'm not going to comment so much on the, on the UK situation, but just why are things looking slightly more optimistic uh, for innovation? First is that the science has advanced, and there is a fun foundational shift, whether that's how targets for drugs are discovered through genomics, which is really coming into its own in a way that it wasn't 10 years ago, whether it's the ability to undertake clinical trials, and we heard that in the last uh, session, particularly ones that can now really pick the patients that might respond, has got better. Modalities have got better as well. In other words, we're beyond just small molecule chemistry. I mean, small molecule chemistry remains a bedrock for a lot of this, but there's an awful lot of other things coming through. And artificial intelligence is going to make a difference in some of this. So there's a whole load of sort of scientific things which make it, I think, easier to, to think about innovation. And we can see that in the number of things coming through, particularly small companies, but also increasingly in big companies. The second thing is that we're in an era, and this is a really important thing, I think, for access. We're in an era of cures. And, and that you know, may sound odd, but if you look back across the whole history of the industry, it's quite difficult to pick out cures. I mean, you know, antibiotics cure you know, the infection then you get a bit stuck beyond that as to what actually cures. Well, we've had now cures for HCV. We've got cell and gene therapies that look like cures in the sense you give them once and they last a lifetime. And whether that's a cure or not, you can argue. But we're in a different era, which means actually we've got to think quite differently about innovation and where that lands. And we've also got massive advances in prevention. And we saw that with vaccines and advent of messenger RNA and viral vector vaccines completely changing the ability to do things. So I think there's a lot of reason for optimism, actually. Uh, and the challenge for healthcare systems is how do you actually harness that properly? And my rather sort of simple starting point is innovation is good for patients, it's good for healthcare systems, and it needs to be equitable. And, uh, and we need to work out how to make that happen. And then my final sort of comment is um, data, healthcare data, where we can already see that healthcare data should be usable to select patients for trials, to help with target identification, and for making the whole system run better. But actually, there are many constraints put in place that make that difficult. And I think many of those areas have been recognized in the UK, and COVID caused a massive change in the ability to suddenly utilize them when we saw the benefits of that. Thank you. Uh, Carol, your yeah. comments on the question. Well, I think I'm with you on don't believe surveys, but when they have that scale of change, I think you've got to pick up some signal from it. Um, and certainly, the, the, the optimism there is in the conversations that we would all have about the UK and life sciences, I think has changed in in that time frame. So what do I, what do I think, what do I put it down to? It's, it's impossible to attribute it to one or two factors. There have been massive initiatives going on in the UK, but I'm going to, to pick out two sort of mo much more human factor um, things. And the first is the level of engagement that there's been between industry and government. I think it has ramped up enormously. Is it due to Brexit? Quite possibly. You know, we, ha we had to up our game in the UK to become more attractive uh, on a global stage. But that engagement between industry and government and those that participate in the government sector, if I could put it that way, has made a massive difference. And it's because that engagement was real and it was meaningful and both sides listened. And when you've got, when you've got both parties listening to, 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 to each other, magic actually does happen. And the, the magic is being converted then, we'll hopefully talk about the, uh, the life science vision, is being converted into tangible things that are taking place here. So engagement, absolutely. My second one, which follows on from that, is, is commitment. I think there is a real commitment, not just from government, but from industry, to make the UK a good place for life sciences. I, I think that, and we've, we've all spent quite a few years in, in this sector, I think there is a real passion for people working in the life science industry in the UK for life sciences, for, for everyone to be proud of life sciences in, in the UK. I think there is a, absolutely a commitment from government uh, to capitalise on 
the assets that we've got in the UK and to build on them. And I don't think it's just government. I think it's all of the agencies that are the, are the key players in the life science ecosystem want life sciences to thrive in the UK and want to be able to, to pull through what's being done in life sciences into impact for people and people's lives. And I think we've just, you know, we have probably have got a magic moment. It doesn't happen, it doesn't happen uh, every year, but we've certainly got a magic moment that we can build on. Thank you, Carol. Um, David, could you pick up on the same and maybe cover a bit of the life sciences vision given here? Yeah, well, I think I would say that um, the one thing that is common to all discussions with big pharma or biotech is their belief that the UK, in, in the UK, particularly Oxford, Cambridge and London, has world-class research. I mean, that is fundamental to this. And there was a worry at the time of Brexit. And I should add, for the record, I hated Brexit and still hate Brexit. <laughs> but, um, but nevertheless, we had feared at the time that we would lose a lot of good people, and we didn't. And that may have been partly because Donald Trump was in America, and so America didn't look quite so attractive. <laughs> nevertheless, we didn't lose a lot of people. Second thing is we put a lot more money in it. Mark is here, who was running UKRI, UKRI at the time. A lot more gov government money came into research, a much bigger commitment from government for research. I, but I think the other thing that's important is, is that I think we are the only country in the world where one could convene a meeting with the regulators, MHRA and NICE, the NHS, um, industry, and sit around the table and work out an innovative deal. You know, we did it with Grail, we did it with Inclisiram, we've done it on a, some cancer drugs, we've almost done it on polygenic risk cores. So I don't think any other country in the world can do that. Um, and we could do that. And, and because we are a, a single-payer system, we have a particular advantage when it comes to population health. Now, we have not fully utilized that yet. Um, but we're talking about patients' access to medicine. The fact is that pharma have gone down the rare disease route or, you know, over the last 10 years. We have to address the bigger more common burdens of disease in society. And we have to do that on a preventative basis. We are perfectly incentivized. I'm looking here to my colleague on my right here. <laughs> we are perfectly incentivized to spend money on prevention because we've got people for life. You know, in America, they, they split from one insurance company to another. We've got them for life. And this is where we are failing as a healthcare system, not just here, but around the world. But we are perfectly incentivized to do population health deals with industry for new drugs attacking the silent pandemics, not just the infectious pandemics, but the silent pandemics of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, respiratory medicine. And that, for me, is the big opportunity going forward. Thank you. So, On to me. Yeah. Great. So, I mean, I think I'd say, you know, what's our report card at the moment? It's probably a 2-1 in British parlance. I'm South Africa, we'd say A and Bs. Um, so I think our strength comes from, we're a 2-1, which is not a terrible report card, but none of us here are happy with being a 2-1. We want to be straight first. So we've, you know, we're okay where we are, but I think we've got much bigger ambitions. So, I, I mean, what would I say is um, kind of the strengths in the 2-1 the, the grade would be, um, collaboration that uh, Carol talked about is, is really quite distinctive and sometimes that feels soft and fluffy and sometimes it's quite hard edged. So an example of hard edge collaboration is the innovative licensing and access pathway. When we speak to our um, colleagues overseas, nowhere else in the world does the regulator and reimburser kind of work so closely together. Do we have it 100% sorted? No, much more needs to be done. But that's you know, real hard edge collaboration that's unusual. Second thing is that I think we're starting to become more and more innovative about how we think about value. So a good example of that is um, what we recently did with antimicrobials, you know, where there is market failure, where we have to radically rethink about reimbursement. We move to something like a subscription model. So that's, I think, given people a flavor of, hang on, this is a country that can do some things pretty differently. Um, and then I think the last is that we're all talking today about medicines, 
but we're going to be world, moving into a world of hybrid technologies. You know, we are in a world of hybrid technologies, but they're going to become more and more prevalent. And we actually have a great tech sector, and a lot of the kind of reimbursers and regulators of tech and medicines are quite close together. So I think it makes these hybrid assessments much easier here. So I think those are the, the good things. The, the kind of, you know, why it's not a straight A scorecard is that on the pure access point of, you know, do patients get um, medicines reimbursed and how long does it take? We're probably top quartile, top third, if you compare us to the rest of Europe. And, you know, I think the question then for all of us is, is that good enough and what more needs to be done? Perfect. Thank you, Sam. Um, so I am going to ask for audience questions straight away because there were so many questions in the previous session. I, I thought that we would take questions immediately. If you're still... Paul, oh, okay, we'll take a question from here. Thank you. Can you Thank direct you. your question and then uh, the panelists you'd, li you'd yeah, like to answer? Sure, Thank sure. You. Thank you. Uh, you just mentioned antimicrobials and, and that really rings a bell because I think in the last few years, UK has been one of the global leaders yeah. in discussing the need for changing the access model for hospital anti-infectives and antimicrobials. But I'm wondering, are we there yet? Meaning, are we ready for a paradigm shift? What, what's your perspective here? So, I mean, in that specific circumstance, yes, right, because we've just gone through the process and we've just done the um, value assessment. I think the, the antimicrobials feels a little to be like the COVID example. It was such a clear market failure. There was such a poor pipeline that clearly something needed to be done. So I think it's shown us that there is, there is this alternative um, world in which value assessments can be done and one can be very creative about payment models, moving to things like subscription. But it's the same challenges with COVID is um, how do we, you know, not just in a completely um, extreme circumstance, think about value assessment more creatively. So I think that's the, the shift we're in, which is exactly the same as you know, the COVID trials conversation earlier, is how do we bring some of the learnings? just going to build on Sam's comment because you've got you've gone straight for str straight to the uh, to the hard question of of you know how we've we've all the UK is great at having pockets of really interesting innovative things what it's probably not so it's not so easy to do is amplification of those and develop developing the rules for which that amplification is going to apply. So if, if I'm taking an, antimicrobials, the, the, the innovation there is the, is the payment, well, the, the HTA then informing a very creative space for, for new payment models. So firstly, HTA informed, so haven't lost any of that discipline and rigor, but then going into a much more creative space. What should that apply to? C can it apply to everything? Could we, could we leap straight from... Um, what's been done in antimicrobials to, to everything that NICE does, that's going to be rather difficult and probably not necessary because for the vast majority of new technologies, it should be relatively f straightforward to develop a value proposition that meets the criteria. So you ha what we have to get creative about is almost a demand, a demand signaling pathway for what types of technologies, what types of therapeutics, what types of therapy areas are we going to need to apply this very much more creative style of negotiation deal making, all still informed by a very rigorous value assessment, and how are we going to be able to signal that so that it doesn't completely flood um, what NICE um, has to do in a routine way? I think it's quite a challenge. <laughs> quite interested to hear if anyone has some ideas about that one. <laughs> Got to do it. Thank you. Um, Leo, I know you have a question. Yeah, I do. Uh, first of all, thank you for sharing all your insights and for being here. Really appreciate it. Um, my question is an are you ready question, are we ready question as well. And it's, it's related to the previous panel and this one. We've talked about the role of technology and digital in helping us do things quicker, simpler, in an easier way. There are, and it's really exciting in terms of what's happening in the sector. Are we ready to start embracing that and moving quick enough so that ultimately we can provide good outcomes to patients? Who would like to take that? Well, I mean, the answer is we're not anywhere near where we need to be on adopting new digital therapies and digital ways of monitoring people's um, behavior and disease progression. 
Um, interestingly, AstraZeneca, I think, are doing probably more work than anybody that I'm aware of in the pharma space on, in digital. Uh, and they did a very interesting randomized control trial which showed that digitally following follow-ups were um, of um, cancer drugs. I can't remember which cancer drug it was now. It actually gave, I think, six months longer life than um, the normal traditional sort of three-month follow-up with physicians. But, I mean, I think this is a question both for reimbursement and regulation, and it's, I think it will be pretty much top of your list, Sam. It is. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not there yet. <coughs> Patrick, could you comment on Yeah, that? well, I mean, the, the answer is no. We're not, we're not where we need to be at all, and there's a massive opportunity there. Um, and there's a massive opportunity for the use of digital and, and tech in the NHS to facilitate all of this. And um, the example I'll, I'll give you, which is now l probably a decade old, is when I was at GSK and we, we, we tried to do a sort of real world study in one place using electronic health records. We did it, but it was bloody difficult to get that off the ground and to make it all work. And it was actually very successful in the end. It tells you what you can do if we have good healthcare data and you can access it and use it in, in, in real world. And many alluded to this in his answer in the previous panel, real-world data collection can be a way of really facilitating innovation and pulling it through, but you've got to have the system set up to do it, and you've got to allow access to those data in order to be able to evaluate it. And I think we're, we've got quite a good baseline in this country, theoretically, but we need to operationalise it in a way that works. And, and, and very often, you know, you've got quite big gaps. And the reason that we ended up doing the study in Salford when we did it was that was the only place that actually had properly linked records in a way that you could operationalise such a study. It was interesting, actually, the other thing about that was that, that um, talking to the FDA at the beginning about uh, doing a study in Salford drew very blank looks. You know, <laughs> what the hell is this place? Why do we care what happens in a wet city in, 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 in the UK? And, of course, once it was done, it started to become actually a paradigm for how you could do um, trials in, in, in everyday practice. Thank you, Patrick. Can, can I, just on, the, just on this, if, yeah, if, because that so. Salford Lung study was a very groundbreaking study very long time ago. Yeah. We haven't seen the, the change <coughs> in, the, in the way that, that trials can be both developed and delivered to, to randomise and collect real-world data in the way that we that we should. It's it's taken years and years and we're still not there. That would be my number one focus for the future. Thank you, Carol. Sam? So, um, just to build on some of the comments, I give a tip from a group of um, NHS frontline clinicians that I was with this morning, and it was that was exactly the question. Are we ready for adoption of digital technology? What's your, um, how are you feeling about it? What's worrying you? And um, the, the kind of score out of three was everybody was about 1.5, quite a lot of optimism. But the biggest worry, incidentally, was digital exclusion. And, and I'm kind of raising it here because we see, we, we have a program where we look at digital technologies in NICE. We review the, the guidance every single week. And the number one um, thing that we often don't have data to make a decision on is equity impacts. So we often say, you know, who are the excluded populations, where have we got data from, and it's not included in the main evidence submission, it's not included in the trial, and we have to run around and speak to such and such a CCG that did such and such. So that would be the number one thing I would think about, is really please do include that in your trial designs and in your reporting and in your, and in your communication to those who will be adopting it. So you may, may support Martin's comment about digital apartheid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah people are worried about my gran can't use her iPhone. Yeah. What's going to happen to her? It's literally that level. It's not, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, you had a, oh, sorry. Yeah. I'll take uh, this question. I thought, uh, you, did you have a question, Mark? Uh, in a minute, yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> so my question is around a uh, question of vision. So, okay, we, this is where we are, and this is, um, I guess, where we are not, and we are not ready to be, but where should we be? Where do we want to be, right? And I'm talking of perhaps in the next five years, but even looking f further forward, because I think my interest is in trying to, to think of what the future could look like and being part of shaping that conversation and shaping that future. It'd be interesting to know what you see that being. Would you like to kick off with that? 
I mean, I mean, the future, I mean, the, pr the present, I mean, healthcare systems are failing. I mean, let's be completely clear about that. And that's true in America, it's true in the UK, it's true in Europe. We are, we're, they're unaffordable and the life expectancy is plateaued and falling. I mean, so, you know, we are failing. Uh, and I think the only way we can address that is we move to a much more preventative, personalized, precision medicine based system with more prediction, much more earlier treatment, early diagnostics. If we carry on pouring money into the existing system, we will carry on failing. Um, and indeed, the problems we're facing today in the NHS are identical to the problems we were facing in 2000, 2002. Ambulance t changeovers too long, bed blocking, six million people on waiting lists, too late to get diagnostics. I mean, it, nothing has changed. And, and, you know, it's a definition of madness, isn't it? Doing the, doing the same thing again and again and expecting something different to happen. Because we can't drive productivity through the NHS or, you know, we have no capital spend in the NHS or very little. So we're not getting any, there will be no massive improvement in productivity. I, I think we have to change the paradigm completely from sick care to health care. Until we do that, I think we'll continue to be in difficulties. Just, Patrick, you had yeah, a comment just, on this? I'm going to give quite a brief answer to this, which is if you look at the uh, letter that we wrote from the Council for Science and Technology uh, about a year or 18 months ago, you'll see exactly what we think about what the future looks like. And it's pretty different from the present. And it requires quite a big reimagination of the hospital and primary care system, as well as, as David has said, more prevention. And there are ways to achieve that but they require enormous political will and public support to try and do it. It's very difficult to change these things, and we made some recommendations as to how one might go about trying to do that. But it has to be integrated. I mean, you know, part of the beauty of this is there is a systems answer to this, and the danger is we pick off one thing at a time rather than trying to make the more radical change that's probably necessary. Thank you. Carol? It's, it's a really difficult intellectual dilemma because we've, we've talked here um, about the, the, the big hitters and prevention. So thinking in a public health perspective and thinking about getting in earlier and earlier. But the populations within those big health problems are not the same. We've talked about that already. So we've, we've got to layer that public health perspective with the pre precision perspective. That's going to take a huge amount of different style thinking because we do have to segment populations at a population level. And then we have to think about what types of technology combinations are going to be right for that, that particular segment. So every single tool in the toolbox will need to be out and used in order to do the system change that Patrick has been talking about. It's, I think it is a really difficult challenge, but I think we do have a moment here. And it's, you know, Bre we can talk about Brexit, we can talk about COVID as the, as the underlining basis, perhaps, for our desire to change, but we've got it and we should, we should use it. Yeah, everything's been shaken up and we've got a, a post-pandemic window, if you like. Um, Mark. Can I ask about a, a question of access that Patrick mentioned briefly, which yeah. is that the new technology seems to come at astronomical price. Yeah. And one of the tragedies of COVID is that the rich have got richer, but the poor have got much poorer. And so we've seen, and so even when there's access within the country, and you look at the distribution of vaccines, for example, we did amazingly well with the distribution of vaccines, but nevertheless, we didn't reach all of the population. So there's inequity of access within the country, which is a sort of health system problem in a sense, and then there's gross inequity between countries. And I guess the latter is about the values of the companies, but I do worry if you looked at the price of some of the vaccines, the new technology isn't necessarily come with high cost of goods. Uh, are there any answers to these questions? Well, I'd also like to add, there's, there's a very interesting example with EQRX, which actually has a, an innovation passport. I know you might not be able to comment on the details of it, but my understanding is that they received an innovation passport because of pricing, because they were uh, willing to offer radically lower pricing. So maybe genericize that question a little bit and comment on Mark's, uh, Mark's point as well. David? 
Well, what is interesting to me, Mark, is that the NHS was built on free, uh, equal access, and yet the amount of co-pays, co-payments we make in the UK now, um, in percentage terms, is about the same as the US. So the truth is, I'm afraid, as always, in any system devised by man, the middle classes will find a way through it. And as primary care has become under more and more pressure, uh, people living in social deprived backgrounds are getting less and less access to it. And uh, I mean, what is the worst commentary, I think, about the last 20 years of, of British economics and politics is that health inequalities have widened over that time. Now, COVID has accentuated that widening as it happened for, for the reasons that you gave. Coming to pricing, you know, the vaccines are a lot cheaper than most drugs, I might add. And, and of course, if we can get much, much lower pricing, the UQRX cancer drugs, a classic example of that, of course, from a healthcare systems point of view, we're going to want to do that because we want to widen access to those drugs. We can only widen access if, they're, if they are priced on a population basis, not on a very narrow segment of the population basis. So from a healthcare systems point of view, and I know not, this, won't, uh, this won't be music to every pharma company's ears here. Of course we want to drive population-based pricing. And of course, we as a healthcare system will be put a, putting pressure on NICE to reflect that. Patrick? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's obviously really important that one thinks about equitable access to innovation. And if you look at the vaccines, because you raised that example, it's quite interesting that the AZ model was one that we facilitated in the UK to just make that vaccine available and kudos to everyone involved at cost. It still didn't get distributed equitably across the world. So that is not a price issue. There are many other things in there, including actually affordability, which is obviously slightly different from price. In other words, countries, some countries simply didn't have the ability to take it up and use it. So I think, I think it's, it's not right to put the entire issue of equitable distribution on drug pricing in companies, even though that is clearly part of it. The second point I wanted to make is that as you think about cures and they're, they're, or, or treatments that are dramatically effective, there's going to have to be, in my view, a different way of thinking about how you price those. So if you take some of the cell and gene therapies, you know, a million dollars, or if you take a much simpler example, which is hepatitis drug 80,000, you could argue 80,000 pounds to cure a disease is a reasonable price to pay compared to the total healthcare costs of that disease. The affordability in year is not. And so I, I think there are whole questions around how you think about amortization and other models in order to think about, uh, about making things affordable within a system where there inevitably has got to be a profit margin somewhere there. Thank you. I know we have a question from Gerhardt over here and then I'm gonna to go to Ed over here. So can we get a microphone? Thank you. Yes. So thank you very much for the comments and I'm stunned a little bit about the statements about digitization which I heard in the first and the second panel. Because when I'm taking the example for the United Kingdom, it's most likely that more than 95% of the people are walking around with sensors. It's most likely that almost everybody is kind of generating millions of data points when I'm just moving my hand from left to right, which actually can contribute um, to actually making better treatment decisions. So I would expect, you know, from the leaders of a government, but also from the NHS, that actually thinking about how can the data treasure, which I'm collecting, and perhaps that gives me predictive analysis that I might have got a cardiac disease, that I might get depression, that it can be better used. And I think this is also as a representative of the pharmaceutical industry and one of the major vaccine companies which helped also to develop the mRNA vaccine. The question I'm asking also is, you know, is it really truck price or is it the question, what are the profits used to actually benefit mankind? And this is the conversation we would like to have. And this is a conversation we also challenge you because currently we see a disconnect about healthcare data being generated, but actually this being effectively used to optimize access. Thank you. We'd like to respond to that. Do you want me to have a go? Sam, thank you. 
I doubt I'm going to do your question justice, but let me have a go. <laughs> so many I'm layers to that. <laughs> um, so uh, how, how can we make sure we use data to in, in improve access? I suppose the, in nice we're thinking about it in two ways, and, and I acknowledge your challenge, maybe they are too limited. So, so the first way is to say, can we set up um, kind of data gathering agreements like managed access um, so that we can get more and more certain on certain parameters along the life cycle of the medicine? As you know, we've had that for a long time in cancer, and now we're moving to non-cancer medicines through the Innovative Medicine Fund. So I think that's quite a well-trodden um, area. When we... Um, and I think the Innovative Medicines Fund is going to be quite interesting in thinking about how do we set up those data sets, because the Cancer Drugs Fund is quite simple because there's one data set. This now is an order of magnitude more difficult, and I think a lot of what you're saying about does it provide the opportunities for um, innovative pricing models to be investigated, etc. I think that, that's quite a big air of promise. So that's the, the one issue that we're, we're kind of working on. The second issue... It is more to kind of link what you and Mark were, were talking about is, is how do we link our guidance with uptake and then back into our guidance and uptake and so on and so forth. And I think that's where we are miles away from where we should be because at the moment we are acting all like static parts of the system. So we provide our advice, Godspeed, somebody picks it up in the health system, then you know, we look at our advice again in three years' time and redo the data collection. And so obviously that doesn't make any sense. So, so what the, the world that we're trying to move to, but we're not there yet, is for every recommendation we have, is it a little package of data that can go into things like electronic health records, decision support tools, that we can automatically collect the data on compliance with that, feed that back automatically into our assessments. So we're a long way from that. We're trying at first... Um, this year with a non-COVID guideline. But I think that's the world in which you start to get that flywheel effect that you're talking about. Um, we're only one part of it, obviously. Thank you. Carol? I don't have the answer to your question because it's far too complex. <laughs> far, far too complex. And no, the it's reason easy. it's so complex it's is easy. because... Hold on, <laughs> hold on. The reason it's so complex is because it plays at every single level of... of in a sense, the problem of delivering healthcare, because you have you have you have a you have a diverse population who have both needs, but also their own f views about how they they want their data to be used. So you've got to try to balance those two things. You've also got where whereabouts in in the um, in the treatment pathway are you going to apply that that data that is being generated? With I'm sure we've all got. Um, our smartwatches on. Where, where are you going to apply it? And what sort of analytics do you need to do? We, have, we haven't even touched the surface of thinking about how we make use of routinely collected data across any of the value chain of, of, of drug discovery and access. I really, that, that is a massive, massive topic that we can't possibly cover today. But one thing I am, I am going to um, say that maybe, uh, maybe encourage you, uh, in one, of, one, one of my hats is, is with the Medicines Discovery Catapult. And one of the massive areas um, that we're, we're spending quite a lot of time on is how you use routine data to get insights into two things. One is, um, uh, target identification, so new targets from insights into routine population level data. And, and the second is how you then, again, the amplification uh, question, how you can use that routine data to ampli amplify the sensitivity of that target on the, pop on the population. They're just two tangible examples about how you can start using that data but we haven't touched the surface of your question and I don't think we're going to be able to do that for quite a long time. Thank you. I know Ed's been patiently waiting. Do you have a mic, Ed? Yeah, can I, sorry, Gerhard, can I run it round? Thanks. Sorry, Ed. 
you, when you're in COVID, you didn't have all this information system and nice and everything to help you, but week in, week out, you had to try and collect all this data and do all this science covering prevention and all of the spheres, treatment vaccines. Um, if someone persuaded you to do the same for cancer now, um, how might you set up a system of data that, that everybody could use? What, what were the secrets and how is it different to the way the current model works with data uh, and the science? And what, in a sense, what, your, what would your gift be to everybody? <laughs> well, um, I think you're absolutely right that we had very bad data at the beginning. And it was impossible, for example, early on to even know how many people were in hospital. Mm. So very basic data were not available. And the improvement that's taken pl place in the data systems in the NHS over the COVID period has been totally remarkable. I mean, now we've got good data coming in. The second data source that became incredibly important was um, the ability to track what was happening in the community, where at the beginning, it was totally impossible to do that for a number of reasons, including lack of test availability, but also simply the resources available in Public Health England. And it was the Office for National Statistics that stepped in and said, OK, well, we'll have a go at doing this. Interestingly, they were able to call on um, some of the uh, CMOs that were important in the industry to be able to operationalize some of that at the beginning. So that, that, that tells you something quite important, which is building on what you've got is better than trying to invent everything from scratch. And we do have quite a good system in this country for many of the parts of it that we don't often think about using. Uh, and that, that is something I would think about doing. And then in terms of the... Um, other area where I think there was a really important change in ways of working, which isn't a digital one, but it was a it was an organisational one, was in order to get vaccines out, it was very obvious really early on that vaccines were potentially important, even though we had no idea that it was going to be possible to get a vaccine, and that the usual structures in government, NHS, wherever, were not going to work. And that's really what led to the formation of the Vaccines Task Force, of which key principles include things like single point accountable leadership, bringing in industry to work with civil servants and others so you've got a team that's actually got the right expertise, being very clear about the outcome and the timelines over which you want those outcomes, uh, being in a position to be able to um, bring together um, the money and apply it without going through 55 stages of bureaucracy to do it. So there's a series of lessons that come from the Vaccines Task Force, which I've spoken about uh, often, which I think are applicable to other areas, particularly where you want to run something that looks like a mission. They're not good for just sort of generally how we're going to do stuff, but if you want to run a mission, I think there are some very clear principles that can be applied, and they could be applied to certain aspects of cancer. Thank you. And um, we have a question at the back. This might be our last question, actually. Thank you. Um, the historical narrative around innovation in the UK is that we're, we're really good, brilliant even, at the first bit, at the research and the innovation, but historically quite bad at the next bit, the capitalization and the, the spread and the broader picture. Do the panelists think that, that is still true? Is that, is that right? And if it is, what do we do about it? David? Well, I think an important bit of context is that because the, the contrast is often made between here and America, isn't it? Uh, I mean, in America, they spend $11,000 per capita on health care. They've got 367 million people. You know, we spend $4,000 per capita on health care. We've got 67 million people. So in a sense, any uh, startup in the UK has got to start looking at the US pretty quickly. So that, that's one bit of context. Second bit of context is that the the lack of access to capital, to scale up capital, has been a perennial problem in the UK, which has meant that many companies have gone on to NASDAQ much too soon in their journey in order to raise capital, because there simply hasn't been up the crossover or the, or the scale up capital available in the UK. Now that is beginning to change, but unfortunately the institutional mindset in the UK, particularly the pension fund mindset, has been to match future liabilities with their assets, so they're buying government, you know, 1% uh, 
yield kind of securities rather than, rather than into venture funds or private equity or indeed into broader equities. So capital is the second thing. The third thing I think is a mindset issue. You know, in the US, there are multiple entrepreneurs who have done multiple startups who keep doing it time and again, and they think big. In the UK, we tend to bail out quite quickly. You know, you can cash in your 10 million pounds, buy your country house, and, and you know, live happily ever after. Uh, and so we, I think it's a combination of those, of those three things. It is the size of the market, it is lack of capital, and C, I think it's a lack of ambition, uh, personal ambition would be the, my explanations for it. Thank you. Sam? So, so maybe I'll reflect on the, the uptake data that I've seen. So that's, you know, post reimbursement decision, how many people actually of the eligible population get access to the medicine. And I think when you look at the average figures, you're right, they look low and slow. But when you look within the figures, we see three populations. So we see the um, specialized commissioning hospital based patients where there's a central payer, there's few clinicians, that's actually pretty quick. So when we speak to industry, they say, actually, sometimes you're the best in the, in the world on those. Then we see the next population, which is specialized commissioning, oh, sorry, secondary care, not necessarily specialized commissioning. We're probably okay. And then we see the third population, which may, may be um, not specialized commissioning, so locally commissioned primary care. And that's where we have historically really struggled with um, uptake. Um, so I think, firstly, we're seeing different populations and each of them need different um, solutions. I think on primary care, this is something that we're working through at the moment, is can folks like us, NICE, work more effectively with NHS England and others to say, we see this as a primary care medicine, it's coming, we know it's going to be difficult, what are the things that would help? So, for example, you know, what's the position of the professional communities on this? Are they supportive or not? What's the position in terms of... Um, uh, primary care payment models and incentives? Are they aligned or not aligned? What's the position in terms of roles and training around this? What's the, so I think um, we know where it's going to be difficult. Can we work together a bit more as partners to say what are all the levers that we can pull? I don't think all of those levers are going to completely solve it, but I think we treat everything the same and kind of plop it out in the system and hope for the best. Thank you. Um, so unfortunately, we've come to the end of the panel session now, but I did want to close with one last question. Um, so I'd like each of you to give um, uh, which of the sort of key initiatives, a specific initiative, that you would export from the UK to other markets. So you pick, pick your winners. Would you like to start, Sam, and we'll come this way? <laughs> yeah, I'll start. So I would love it to be the innovative licensing and access pathway and the, the vision would be, imagine if we had data sharing and um, kind of common models and common evidence requirements across regulators and HTA agencies throughout the world. So you didn't have to do your 20 models or 100 models, however you do. You didn't have to argue with parameter values with 500 people. I think that would be the one. Well, I will give a, a view which, given how sort of self-critical I am of the NHS, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, which may surprise you, which I actually think that a single-payer integrated system is the best model of care. Mm. So, I mean, that is slightly counterintuitive because it, that doesn't mean to say that we don't get things completely, you know, we could do things so much better, but actually I think that, that structure is, to, me, to, to me is the best structure. So I would, I would export that. Yeah. So Sam's stolen my thunder because I'm going to go Eurovision style and vote for ILAP as well. It is, it is absolutely groundbreaking. And if we can amplify that both within the UK and across the globe, we'll have done a really useful thing. A really useful thing. Thank you, Carol. Patrick. Yeah, well, I would have gone with David's, but he's taken it. So I will say, um, <laughs> actually, the way that the MHRA approach regulation during COVID was an extraordinary example of how a regulator can accelerate innovation and pull through. And I think if that it could be exported elsewhere, that would really make a difference. Fantastic. Thank you very much. And so I wanted to say a, um, thank you so much to all the panellists uh, for your uh, contributions today. Thank you for all the questions from the audience, which made it much more fun. Uh, please can we finish with giving the panellists a round of applause.